Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to carrylutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. Fourteen ninety WGCH. This is Kerry Lutz. You're listening to the Financial Survival Network, and if you're worried about how to educate your kids, concerned about sending them to failing schools, well, my next guest and I are going to talk about technological solutions for the broken educational system. He's famous. He's written books, radio. John C. Dvorak. How you doing, John? Hey, Kerry. Doing well. Thanks. Hey, well, thanks for coming on the Financial Survival Network. And I know that you're kind of the tech critic, tech cynic in some ways, but I've been seeing with education so much technology coming out that the schools don't have a clue how to use or implement. And now it looks to me like with the iPad, the Kindle, and the Nook that education is going to really be revolutionized. What's your thought on it? I really doubt it. Um, I, you know, education is not uh, determined by new technologies. Technologies don't really contribute to education much. It's really a one on 20, one on one kind of relationship between a teacher and the taughty. And I don't see that. Uh, I mean, I people will always scream, especially so I'm in Silicon Valley. So everybody gets all bent out of shape when you suggest what I'm suggesting, which uh, which is we've had uh, computers in school since the Apple II, almost 30 years. They've been Apple does, uh, computers in schools and they keep trying to do this and that to uh, lessen the load on the teacher and do all these other things. It might be good for maybe taking tests or or as a recess process or somebody wants to play games. But generally speaking, uh, computers never become anything more than the original teaching machines of the 60s, which have always been sketchy devices. Um, Control Data had a whole series of them, the Play-Doh system. Oh, In fact, I, I, I played on that when I was younger. And uh, they don't, uh, I mean, it's, it's semi-functional, but there's nothing like a teacher at the head of a class that knows what he's doing or what she's doing, uh, telling the kids and, and, under, and kind of sensing what they, the directions they want to go and then having them read books. I think the Kindle's okay for like uh, casual book reading and I think it's a good way to put a lot of books on a small, air, uh, small device and I think it's nice that the kids don't have to lug these books back and forth because nowadays it seems to be a some sort of tradition to make a kid uh, it's like some sort of slavery thing they got the kid carrying a big rock <laughs> you know from here to there every day is a, some sort of sick exercise uh, a Kindles kind of eliminate that but they're expensive uh, they break uh, they can be stolen there's all these issues I mean, people rarely steal textbooks uh, I'm not a big fan of the technology in school mm -hmm. but we got this failing system it's not working. It's not serving the kids. It's turning out basically idiots like that movie uh, Idiocracy. That's what. Oh, yeah. No, it's a, abs absolutely turning out idiots. I agree. So what do we do? I mean, you see these kids who've been homeschooled and they excel beyond anybody's expectations. They're always winning the geography bees, the spelling bees, and also they probably haven't gotten the stuffing beat out of them by the bullies in school. So... What's our alternative here? Uh, we well, I, you, you, for, well, first of all, you're talking to someone who's a homeschooler. Uh oh, so <laughs> I homeschooled my daughter and and uh, somewhat my uh, one of my sons, but uh, she went finally went to a regular school and of course just aced everything, which is classic. And the great thing about homeschooling, which I recommend to parents with children that will do it, if you have to the child has to sign on, they have to volunteer. And once they do, then you have uh, leverage and uh, they tend to perform very well, although they work at, you know, weird off hour pace. I mean, they don't it's not like a nine to five job. And um, I don't everybody knows the system's broken. There's a bunch of people researching this uh, and they're trying to figure out what to do about it. And they've tried all these. And now we have Bill Gates and Melinda Gates coming in with money to push charter schools, which a lot of experts that are concerned about these problems think is a bad idea, essentially cherry picking a neighborhood. And uh, I 
I think the thing has to be overhauled in such a dra- in a very radical way. And I think that this window dressing of bringing in an iPad so kids can, you know, essentially play Angry Birds is what they're going to do. Hmm. Uh, and sure, some of them will read and some of them might get something out of it. And they might be able to make presentations, you know, with a computer that are cool. They have a lot of kids doing PowerPoints now. I don't think that's a fix. I think it's just a it's just a patch. Right. So you've got personal experience homeschooling. Can you take a parent who's not as educated as you, but maybe a little more disciplined, can they take any kid and can that kid be homeschooled and receive a superior education if the child, like you said, buys into it? I think so. Now, in California and Washington State, where we live, the uh, and we, we homeschool uh, officially through Washington State, which has an entire statewide program, including testing, uh, and very, very, very advanced. California is a little less amenable, so you don't really, you know, it doesn't help too much. But but even in California and Washington, they require that one of the parents or a, any, if it's a single parent, the parent have a college degree to do this in the first place. Now, from my experience, um, I think it's the, the my wife did a, a, at least two thirds of the work and she probably learned more while homeschooling because she had to, you know, find textbooks and she had to read them. She had to be able to answer questions. It's actually a good kind of a brush up for parents to homeschool a, a child, especially uh, say they're in the seventh or eighth grade, because most of that stuff that they teach in those grades, we long since forgotten anyway. So it's actually a fairly good uh, uh, experience for the parents. And I think they, and it the, the brings the parents closer to the children in a lot of different ways because you're kind of learning together, but the parents are the supervisors. It's a very interesting um Structure. Also, p- people don't understand about homeschooling is it really has a massive infrastructure in this country to work. There are all kinds of clubs and groups. And if you want your child to be going on field trips every week, there's plenty of ways of making that happen. There's uh, homeschooling clubs that uh, have uh, usually some cheerleader type who always taking the kids, you know, grabbing a group of kids and taking them somewhere. And and it's also a multi-culti very positive multi-culti environment because a lot i'd say and i think the research would would back this up uh you have about one third of the one third maybe less than a third of the homeschooled kids are christian and they're taught in a very rigid form and they tend to be a little uh, more uh, less welcoming to be honest about it than the other groups including the muslims a lot of homeschooled muslims and they like to uh, get big groups together to go do group activities and homeschooled jewish same thing and then probably a, at least 25 percent of the group you can say 25 for each of these groups is uh, just agnostic Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, will join these different groups and go floating around or go to a lecture series or something like that. And it's not, except for the Christians, it's generally speaking, it's not very religious. Right. And when you're teaching your kid at home, did you have set periods like, okay, when you wake up, uh, homeroom? Yeah, a little uh, bit. And then English? Well, just... You, you you take a look at the, what the schedule calls for for the week, and then you try to figure out what's most convenient to do. It's it's pretty loose, mm-hmm. as long as it gets done. Right, and then then when it came to the testing, uh, what if a kid didn't do well in a course or blew a test? What would you do then? Well, it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> it never happens. <laughs> it's really rare. That's amazing. Because there's because all these homeschooling books, all the texts that you get from these homeschooling stores, there's stores that are filled with stuff, uh, tend to have a lot of go, you know, make you test along the way. So that if the kid starts falling behind, they immediately get stopped in the process. Mm -hmm. So you don't spend like a semester and then go to the state test and find the kid doesn't know anything about history. It just doesn't happen. So there's diagnostic tools and intervention when the kid isn't getting it then, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And w- w- your opinion, if somebody didn't have a college education, if they, you know, just the, they had a couple of years of college or a couple of semesters, you think they would be able to do it just as? Yeah, if they could? wanted to. I want to caution some people. There's a, there's a number of theories about how to homeschool, and there's a couple of these things called unschooling, and uh, there's a, essentially you don't do anything. And that's actually a legitimate theory that, I think is a is a disaster waiting to happen, but uh, uh, you have to 
you probably would have to i would research it a little bit before i got into it and see what the how hard it is and you but it's not as hard as you think and it's it's very it's a good it's a good situation and you can travel a lot more if you have you know say if you're a person who likes to travel and you're not really tied down it's good for like writers and artists uh, you can just go and homeschool along the way a lot. Most child actresses, actors and actresses are all homeschooled as they float around the world. Really? Huh. Yeah, well, I guess they'd have to be. But, you know, uh, as this article I was reading said, uh, in the old days, there weren't these schools. Only the rich educated their children through tutors. And then they started these schools that were private schools for the well-or-off merchant class who could then have their kids learn how to read and write. And this devolved down to the public school as we know it now, which is when you look at the budget and you look at the personnel and you see how much time they actually spend learning and that they're a lot more concerned about their vacation days and making tenure and, you know, that they get the proper benefits. It's no wonder these kids don't learn anything there because that's not the priority in so many places, you know? No, it's absolutely true. It's a it's a complete mess. Uh, and by the way, when you mentioned tutoring, occasionally you you might want to bring a tutor in if the child is like my daughter was having a little issues with some one specific form of math, and we actually had to bring somebody in for a, a week. Uh huh. Brought her right up to speed. Um, That's great. The. Uh, yeah, there is the and also the the overhead for today's school systems, the middle managers and all the rest of it has become more of a factory. In fact, I've always said this. I've had, I started noticing this when the Columbine uh, episode took place. You'd look at you saw these overhead helicopter shots of this so-called school, and it, every time I saw it, I said, it "Looks just like the General Motors plant in Fremont." You know, it looks like a factory. It yeah. doesn't look like anything that has anything to do with with educating anybody. It looks some. It, it either looks like a factory or it looks like a prison. This is and this is the environment that these kids are supposed to learn in, and they don't learn anything for obvious reasons. They're in a, they're they're pieces in a factory or they're prisoners. It's you you choose. You can't leave the place. It's more like a prison, I guess. Yeah. Well, I just remember hating school, being bored by it not really understanding its importance or having a clue about it and somehow it sank into my brain over time but it was based on the prussian system of making good soldiers and good em employees you know chess pieces to move across the board and there's so little uh attention paid to actually teaching these kids how to think critically and you know, so many of the times you hire employees and they can't think, they can't solve problems. And that's really, to me, one of the most distressing things because they're totally ill-prepared for the challenges that life are going to throw at them because how are you going to change, how are you going to retool and retrain when the economy changes, right? Well, that would seem so on the surface. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you come into people, contact with people, they've gone through, you know, gone to a good school, in quotes, good college, and yet they learn nothing, and they're really suited for nothing. And it's it's just distressing to see that, you know, the kids just get passed along and never get challenged on, you know, on the basics of life, uh, like uh, opening a checking account, or, hey, you know, you're going to get an apartment, you need insurance, or... Um, you know, one day you're going to own a house. Well, here's how you go get a mortgage. There's no financial education and, and they're still teaching, you know, outdated things. Like, uh, I don't know if you caught this article in New York, there was a guy who got suspended. He was a typing teacher in 2001. Now, why do we have typing teachers at 2001 when these kids are born with computers and he was ogling the, uh, eighth grade girl girls in the, yeah. his class and saying inappropriate things to them so they tried to fire him and uh, they botched the case but they couldn't allow him back in the classroom so he spent 10 years in what they call a rubber room hanging out but he was also a lawyer so he was running a legal practice and he was speculating in real estate and during the course of his suspension he amassed a 10 million dollar real estate fortune and 
they just got public this guy and he resigned now he's getting an eighty-five thousand dollar a year pension and lifetime free medical benefits and that seems to me what the uh, new york city school system has become it's just like you said a factory and all they care about is the teachers the administrators they all get paid and uh it's kind of the kids be damned you know yeah the rubber rooms are notorious they've been known about for a long time and it's just uh it's like the only thing they can do. They're, the teachers' union seems to have a little bit uh, too much. Uh, I mean, they'll have a rationale for these. Well, there's always something that slips through the cracks. And, yeah, well, be, you know, it's, it, overall, it's a better the way we do it. And, it's, yeah, well, there's always a guy like that who can take advantage of the situation, but that's not normal. Yeah, I mean, you, they just it never ends. And so you can't do anything about it. I, I don't know. The whole thing's a mess. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real frustrating when you see that kind of character. And uh, Bloomberg, you know, uh, Mayor Nanny Bloomberg, he said, well, he should have been managing uh, New York City real estate since he was so good at it. That was his answer. And yeah, no, he's a, he makes these snide remarks like that. Yeah, real snarky. And, uh, and it doesn't get to the problem, which is that uh, it is easier to fire just about anybody than it is to get rid of an incompetent uh, and perhaps dangerous teacher. And... You know, those things have got to change, too. I, I think you're right. A whole revamping of the system, just purging it out. They already know what works and what doesn't work in these schools, but the unions uh, have too much power and refuse to let them put in phonics and, and things like that. Frustrating, huh? Well, uh, well, the next level of frustration is what these kids have to pay to go to college. <laughs> Yeah, to go to college and uh, to not be able to get a job after they graduate, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, no, it's it's a mess. And I don't think it's going to change for some number of years. And we're just going to have to, uh, we can grouse about it all we want. It's not going to do any good. And my feeling is the economic collapse here is going to force change, whether they like it or not. Because people in my neck of the woods in New York, you know, paying twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year in property taxes... And even in the good school systems, top rated, there's still deficiencies. And at some point, you just say, what am I getting for my money? And you vote with your feet. And I think you see that happening more and more. So anyway, John, hey, it's really been great having you on. And uh, where do we find you? Where's your site? Well, there's a couple of things people can go look at. We do a political broadcast, uh, Adam Curry and myself, and I would recommend people listen to that, uh, especially the more recent episodes, uh, noagendashow.com. You can also Google No Agenda, and you'll f see how it's a pretty big operation. We have, I think, the first four pages of the, of, the te of the results of No Agenda being Google. Also, most of the things I do are on a uh, kind of a consolidation site called Channel Dvorak, and Dvorak spelled D-V-O-R-A-K, channeldvorak.com. And I'm also in PC Magazine, Market Watch. And I have a blog, Dvorak.org slash blog. And I do a number of podcasts. Uh, and I work, work at Mevio doing some um, video podcasts, the X3 show dot Mevio dot com, uh, Generation X3 dot Mevio dot com, which is actually quite fascinating. It's me talking to three millennials about various topics. <laughs> so you have a baby boomer versus millennials, and it's incredibly educational. People love that show. And uh, then I do DH Unplugged, which is a um, podcast about the stock market with uh, Andrew Horowitz, out of, a Florida uh, money manager. Well, I'm a big fan of that one. And uh, No Agenda, I got to check out the X3 because uh, that one sounds too funny to miss. Well, the, it's the one you're looking for that, you, that I think is, I like the, the X3 show itself. It's good. It's about, we talk about tech, me and two other guys, and it's just us. But I do this thing called Generation X3 with these three millennials and me, and we talk about millennial drug use, binge drinking, all kinds of interesting things. And it's uh, you find it under uh, generationx3.mevio.com. The word show is not in there. All right. Definitely going to check it out, John. And hey, thanks so much for being on. And okay, Carrie. Well, I hope to do this again sometime. Yeah, definitely.